By now, I'm sure you've heard of all the benefits that running a Bitcoin node can bring you and your home. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can run your own Bitcoin node using a Raspberry Pi and the MyNode Bitcoin software. This setup that we're doing is the same setup that I first learned on. I have since changed my setup and I now run a custom Bitcoin node, but this is a really good and cheap way for you to get started and to learn the basics. So jumping right into it, let's set some expectations. What we're going to accomplish in this video is we're going to set up our own personal Bitcoin node using my node. We're then going to set up our Sparrow wallet so that it uses our Bitcoin node so we can truly embrace the don't trust verify ethos. And then finally, we're going to explore some of the other apps that my node ships with things like mempool and other useful apps that I like. This will allow us to use Bitcoin in an unstoppable manner, the way that it was meant to be used. So to get started, we're going to need a Raspberry Pi 4 computer. The Raspberry Pi 5 just came out. Um, but uh, I don't have one, so I'm going to be using a Raspberry Pi 4. I do recommend getting the 4 gigabyte model, though if you can get the 8 gigabyte model of RAM, then that's even better. You're also going to need a micro SD card. I recommend getting 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes. I wouldn't get anything lower than 32, though you can go over 64. The only thing with this drive is we're not going to be storing any like block data on here, so it doesn't need to be that big. The external SSD is where we're going to be storing all the block data. So that's why I recommend getting a uh, one terabyte or two terabyte drive. I actually recommend getting a two terabyte drive since the blockchain data is already approaching like 850, maybe even 900 gigs by now. So if you get a one terabyte drive, it might only be good for another year or two. You're going to need a computer that you can use to set everything up with. And finally, you're going to need a internet connection. So that typically looks like a router with extra LAN connections that you could just plug into with uh, ethernet cables. I found this kit here on Amazon that has everything you need. It has the Raspberry Pi 4, uh, a micro SD, a case, a fan, some heat sinks, and a power cable. It also comes with a HDMI cable so you can plug this into like a TV or like a monitor if you ever wanted to use it that way. But this has basically everything you need. As for the external SSD, I'm using this in this video. This is the Samsung T7 Shield. It's a portable SSD. Um, the one I have is one terabyte though. Like I said, I only recommend getting two terabytes plus also, if you already have like an SSD just lying around somewhere, you can use that as a matter of fact, for my other node that I'm actually running in my living room right now, that one is using an internal SSD. Um, I don't know the name of that one, but I think it's like a crucial brand. It's like, it's like crucial. I don't know, but it's crucial. So really whatever you have, you can use. So this is an overview of what your system should look like when we're all said and done. So as you should have currently right now is everything except for this uh, Raspberry Pi section here. So you have a home network connected to the internet through your modem slash router. So this is typically one or two units. You can have just, you can have uh, an independent modem and an independent router, or you can have an all in one system. But what you need to make sure you have is you need to make sure you have extra LAN ports where you can plug in, um, you know, plug into the network physically. Your computer is connected to the internet through your router and modem by a Wi-Fi connection. So how this is going to work when we have it all set up is your computer, your spare wallet on your computer is going to be able to access your data from your Raspberry Pi by first traversing through the, through the, um, to the router through Wi-Fi. And then your router is going to have a physical connection to your Raspberry Pi. And through that is how they're uh, exchanging data. The SSD and the Raspberry Pi are connected just through regular USB cable. Okay, now that the overview is out of the way, let's talk about what we got to actually do. So the first steps we got to do is we got to set up the micro SD card and setting up the micro SD card is basically just downloading the ISO image or the disk image from the MyNode website and flashing a micro SD with this image. So we're basically writing a, a computer file system onto a flash drive or a micro SD, I should say. So we're going to need a special software to do that, but it's all free. I'll show you how to do it. Then we're going to need to set up our hardware, which is pretty much just putting together our Raspberry Pi, putting it in the case, uh, putting the micro SD inside and connecting it to our network here physically. Uh, step three is just going to be just to turn everything on and let the, let the Raspberry Pi initialize and synchronize the blockchain. Finally, once everything is done synchronizing, we're going to set up Sparrow Wallet to use our new Bitcoin node. Keep in mind that the blockchain synchronization might take some time. I'm talking like hours to possibly days. So you're going to have to be patient. So with all that being said, let's go straight to setting up the micro SD card. But before we do that, I just like to ask if you're enjoying this video, please uh, consider dropping a like, a share and a subscribe. Uh, that really helps this channel grow.
So the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to download the my node disk image. So let's go ahead and navigate to my node btc.com slash download. And then down here under the step one, we're going to want to download the Raspberry Pi 4 image. I just clicked this about two minutes ago, but my internet's really slow. So you can see I'm still struggling to download. So this, this might take some time for you as it's nearly a three gigabyte download. So while this is happening, we also need a software for flashing the disk image after we extract the disk image. So let's go ahead and just get ready for that. So the software I'll be using to flash the disk image is going to be called Belina Etcher. You could download it here at etcher.belina.io for your operating system. Um, I already downloaded this for my Linux machine and you can see it right here. So um, we were not going to be using this right now, but we're going to need this in the next steps after everything downloads. So uh, now that we have that, let's just go ahead and wait for everything to download and we'll pick up right here where we left off. Okay, so some time has passed and everything has finished downloading. The next thing we want to do is we're going to want to flash this image that we just downloaded onto our micro SD card. So first, let's just go to our file explorer and look at the file that we just downloaded. So here it is. You can see that it's a some my node raspi blah 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 dot img dot gz. We need the dot img, so we need to unzip it. I'm on Linux, so this is really easy. I could just right click it and then press extract here. And this is exactly what I need. If you're on Windows, you might be able to do something similar, or you might need to install some third party software like 7zip or gzip or something like that. Same thing if you're on Mac. Now that we have this file extracted, we need to insert our micro SD card. So I'm going to put my micro SD into the adapter and insert it into my computer. And here it is now. There's nothing in it, which is good because when we write to it, we're going to delete everything that's on it. So make sure your micro SD card is clean and everything that you have on it is saved somewhere else. So I'm going to leave this plugged in and now I'm going to open up Belina Etcher. So with Belina Etcher open, we're now going to start configuring our flash. So I'm going to press flash from file and I'm going to find the file that we just downloaded, the .img file. Okay, so we have the image selected. Now we need to make sure that we have the correct SD card selected. So if you want to just verify that, you can just show all of them. You don't want to touch your system drive because this is if you overwrite this thing, your whole computer will just, I mean, your computer will crash. Your, your, your thing will be done. You'll have to fix it. But if you want to double check which drive is the target one, you could always just unplug it and then plug it back in and just see which one's new. So I know this is the one I want right here. So I'm going to go ahead and select it and press flash. I have to insert my system password because, because it's a protected operation. And now we just wait until the flashing is completed. Now that our micro SD card is done flashing, you'll see that it looks different now in your file explorer. That's because we now have like a system file structure on there. So we have like a partition drive now. So it's a little different. We, the, the structure kind of changed. The data structure changed. So we're done with that step. We can go ahead and unplug the micro SD card and put it aside for now. So now that that's done, we need to set up the hardware now. First, we can start by attaching the heat sinks to the Raspberry Pi. I already have my heat sinks attached to mine since this is an old Pi, but they attach like stickers. Like you peel off the paper backing and you just stick it. So to go ahead and do that and uh, build up the case that it's supposed to go into. Here are some pictures of mine. When attaching the fan, take note of the pins I'm connecting this to. This is in reference to the pinout diagram here. You're going to want to connect the red line to plus 5 volts and the black line to ground. Now, since this is just a DC motor powering the fan, it's not really a big deal if you get the polarity reversed. All that will do is just reverse the direction of the motor. Also note that the sticker of the fan is pointing towards the Raspberry Pi when it's when the case is closed. With that out of the way, now we got to plug in the micro SD card. Watch me struggle here with one hand. And then next, we need to plug in the external SSD. Take note of the blue USB spots here. The blue signifies USB 3.0, and that just means we can move data faster through these ones. So these are the ports that we're going to want to make sure we're using. 
Now our last step is to plug in our Raspberry Pi into our home network. So here I am plugging my Raspberry Pi first into the router. That way I could connect to the internet through my router. I'm plugging this into one of my open LAN ports there in the back. And then I'm going to go plug in the Raspberry Pi to the wall. So that's what I'm doing right now. And now we're going to power on the Pi. Notice how we're powering on the Pi when the micro SD card is already in and the external SSD is already plugged in. In other words, all the connections are already in place before I power on the micro SD. Or, excuse me, before I power on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, so some time has passed since I plugged in the Pi, and now we're back on the computer. For me, it's been like over 12 hours, but you should wait at least 20 minutes before going to the computer. So now that I'm here, we should be able to access mynode.local as long as we're on the same Wi-Fi network as the, the Raspberry Pi is on. Here you'll see I'm using the Chromium web browser, and it's giving me an issue. It's saying that I can't find uh, this this name here, mynode.local. However, if I try this from uh, if I try this from my Firefox browser, then it will work. Let's try it again. Let's refresh mynode.local, and you'll see we're in. There was a login screen initially, um, but the default password is bolt, B-O-L-T. So uh, go ahead and just press that in. And um, I was having some issues at first. I was getting a SD card uh, corrupted error, or um, it actually said, um, it said SD card error. So I fixed that by just reflashing my SD card. I guess when I flashed it, the adapter has like a little switch on it. So the switch was in the wrong direction when I flashed the card. So if you hit run into that issue, you might need to do that too. So once we're logged in, we can go ahead and just press format drive since we're gonna format the um, attached SSD. And we just let this, let this work. While this is formatting, let me give you a quick tip. If you don't know, if mynode.local is not working for you, then what you can do is you can navigate to your router's homepage, which mine is 192.168.1.1, and we can look at the attached devices that are connected to this router. So let's do that right now. And here we can see that our Raspberry Pi with mynode is attached or is assigned the 192.168.1.69 address. So we can go ahead and just type in that IP to our web browser here, and you'll see we access my node. So here we're being prompted to decide how we want to use our Bitcoin node. Tor is slower, but it's more private. Uh, since this is just a demonstration, I'm gonna use ClearNet. You can always switch back in between later. So a good strategy is to use ClearNet to download the initial blocks. And then once you are, uh, once you have the entire Bitcoin blockchain downloaded, then you could switch to Tor. That way it's um, less intensive. That way you could download and get caught up right away. But uh, as you're chugging along block by block, you can be using Tor in the future. So I'm gonna use ClearNet for now. And then we just let my node do its thing. After a couple minutes, we arrive at this following screen here. So since we're using the free version, I'm gonna just click choose community edition. And that's it, now we just wait. This is gonna take some time. This is for the blockchain data to sync. So I'll see you when these are all done. Okay, so I'm back and boy, did that take some time. It took about six weeks for me to sync. And then um, also some other things came up. So here I am about eight weeks later. Uh, continuing this video. So here we go. We're going to sign back in using our default password. Bolt says right here. And we are in. So this is the home screen. You can see some quick stats on Bitcoin here. You can expand this and see the blocks. Um, you can manage some stuff here. Yeah, like your RPC usernames uh, and credentials. See your peers. All that fun stuff. I'll let you go poke around uh, on your own time. But what I want to do is I want to set up Sparrow Wallet to use this Bitcoin node. So to do that, we need to first enable this Electrum server. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna say, okay. It's just telling you it's gonna take days for us to sync, which is true. Uh, it's gonna suck because we just uh, we just waited six weeks for Bitcoin to sync. And now we gotta wait a few more days for Electrum to sync. But um, this is the last of the syncing that we gotta do before we can make this happen. So let's just uh, kick this off. Let's check it out. and syncing here. So uh, we'll come back in maybe a day or two and um, and continue with this video. But um, actually, before we leave, let's check it out. So you can enable a Bitcoin pay server. That's really cool, actually. Um, 
RTL is Ride the Lightning, and that's just a lightning uh, terminal that helps you like manage your channels and, and manage peers and stuff like that. Mempool is your own your own uh, your own instance of mempool.space. I'm not sure what this is. Whirlpool is a Bitcoin mixing tool, and um, I do recommend having a little bit of mixed Bitcoin in your possession, knowing you know, and keeping it separate from your other Bitcoin, just in case uh, you need access to some anonymous Bitcoin for whatever reason. Then you have some other uh, premium stuff here with uh, remote access. You can see some settings and and uh, system information, and um, yeah, there's other pages like uh, they give an about page, uh, or status pages. But you could just check this out. But anyways, we're gonna come back when this thing's done syncing. Okay, so a day has passed and our Electrum server looks like it is done syncing. So let's go ahead and connect our Sparrow wallet to our own Bitcoin node through this Electrum server. That way we can do all of our on-chain operations through our own node. So the first things that we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna open up our Sparrow wallet. So here's my Sparrow wallet. Now I'm gonna go ahead and open up my uh, settings here. So I'm gonna go to, or my server settings. So I'm gonna go file settings server and then here's where we config our bitcoin node so the default is a public server but we're going to want to be using our private electrum server so let's go ahead and click this uh, private electrum tab here on the right side now it's asking for our connection information so let's go ahead and grab that from from our my node here so i'm going to go back to my node click the electrum server uh, tab here and here is our connection info so this is our local IP address, as well as two connection ports. This IP address will allow you to connect to this Bitcoin node, but like you have to be on your own home Wi-Fi. If you're not on your home network, then you won't be able to access this. So like if you're at you know your friend's house, you won't be able to access your own node. You'll have to set that up differently, and that's a bit more complicated out of the scope of this video. But anyways, let's go ahead and connect our Sparrow wallet to this. So I'm gonna go ahead and just type it in. 1.69. And we're gonna be using the secure port here. So I'm gonna take that address 50,002 or that port number 50,002. Oops. And because it's the secure port, I'm gonna be using SSL here. So let's flip this tab. And if we test our connection, this should work now. And there it is. So it's that easy. That's how you connect your node. Um, or else you use your own Bitcoin node with a Sparrow wallet. It does take a lot of time to do the syncing steps, but it's well worth it in the end. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Uh, please leave a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.